income tax 2023-2024. Figuring gross profit. Get ready and some coffee. Because if taxes were an animal, the government would definitely be a leech. Ew, get it off. We're trying. We're trying. We've got the salt here. We're doing everything we can. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head, allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey is saying. So get one because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information can be found in Publication 334, Tax Guide for Small Business for Individuals Who Use Schedule C, Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here, having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. Sole proprietorship schedule C rolling into line one of the formula, which is funny because the Schedule C itself is basically an income statement having business income minus business expenses, otherwise known as business deductions, resulting in, in essence, net business income, which rolls into line one income of the income tax formula, basically reflected in the formula on page one of the form 1040 that we see here, Schedule C ultimately rolling into line number eight, additional income from Schedule One. This is a Schedule One, additional income and adjustments to income, part number one, additional income, Schedule C rolling into line three, business income or loss. This is the Schedule C where we have an income statement form format, income minus expenses. All right, so now we're looking at gross profit. In a prior presentation, we discussed cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold being something that's an expense related to the selling of inventory. So if you have inventory, then you're going to have to typically deal with some kind of flow assumption usually and figuring out what the inventory should be, figuring out what the cost of goods sold should be, typically needing to do that from a bookkeeping standpoint, possibly using software such as a QuickBooks or something like that, and then also having to do the cost of goods sold calculation, which is basically a periodic calculation so that the IRS can kind of reconcile a balance sheet account of inventory, meaning last year's beginning inventory is reconciled to the current year's ending inventory. Now, the gross profit is generally, from just an accounting standpoint, kind of a pit stop on the way to the bottom line of the income statement, the bottom line of the income statement being net income. So in other words, with an income statement, which is basically the format of the Schedule C, we really only have like two kind of things, right? We've got basically income and expenses, or we have the top line, the income or revenue, and things that decrease the income or revenue, which might be contra asset account or contra income accounts, like, like the returns and allowances and expense type of accounts. And then we can further categorize those decreases on the way down to get to net income with 
like a multi-step income statement, you might call it, which means we might have income uh, and then we might have the contra income accounts, which would be like returns and allowances we talked about before to get to the net profit uh, re rather than the net income, the net sales, in other words, net revenue. And then we might subtract from that another kind of pit stop along the way a, a very important expense, that being the cost of goods sold calculation, which is supported with our cost of goods sold worksheet, uh, reconciling beginning and ending inventory. Because that number is so important for people that sell inventory, because the cost of the inventory is the largest expense oftentimes of businesses that sell inventory, that's why we want the pit stop to get to basically gross profit which is basically the gross profit before all other expenses other than you know that cost of goods sold and then you've got all the other expenses which you might call operating expenses for example or sales and administrative expenses to get down to basically net income so now specifically we're talking about that figuring of the gross profit so after you figure uh, the gross receipts from your business, we talked about that before, the sales side minus the contra sales account like sales returns and allowances, for example, and the cost of goods sold. We talked about that with the tracking of the inventory. You are ready to figure gross profit. You must determine gross profit before you can deduct any business expenses. These expenses are discussed in Chapter 8. So once we get to gross profit, then of course we have all the other expenses which are the normal operating activity expenses we'll talk about shortly. So businesses that sell products. So figure your gross profit by first figuring your net receipts. So we talked about that before, basically your sales number. Figure net receipts line three on schedule C by subtracting any returns and allowances line two from gross profit. So returns and allowances basically are going to be contra sales accounts, right? And then uh, meaning they take down the sales number, kind of acting like expenses, but up top in the gross, in the in the net sales. Returns and allowances include cash or credit refunds you make to consumers, rebates, and other allowances of the actual sales price. Next, subtract the cost of goods sold, line four, from net receipts, line three. The result is the gross profit from your business. So fairly straightforward once we have the gross receipts and uh, the cost of goods sold. If you don't have any cost of goods sold, then it'll basically be zero if you're in a surface, a service type of company. And this will be quite simple of a, of a calculation because there aren't any cost of goods sold. So business that sells services. So you do not have to figure the cost of goods sold if the sale of merchandise is not an income producing factor for your business. Meaning, in essence, you don't have any cost of goods sold because you didn't sell inventory. You sell services and therefore don't have to deal with that whole uh, calculation of cost of goods sold and reconciling beginning and ending inventory. The gross profit is the same as your net receipts, gross receipts minus any refunds, rebates, or other allowances. Most professions and businesses that sell services rather than products can figure gross profit directly from net receipts in this way. In other words, obviously net receipts minus zero cost of goods sold means that you have the same net receipts. Illustration. This illustration of gross profit section of the uh, income statement of a retail business shows how gross profit is figured. All right, so we have income statement for year ended December 31st, 2023. Remember an income statement, if it was a single step income statement, you basically just have income or revenue minus expenses results in net income. A multiple step income statement, which we pos often use, for businesses that sell inventory are just going to have some pit stops along the road. It's always going to be going down from the top, right? So we got gross profits of 400,000 minus returns and allowances. Returns and allowances are decreasing the top line, kind of like an expense would, but instead of putting it down in the expenses area, we're going to call it a contra revenue account, putting it up top so that we have net receipts not to be confused with net income, the bottom line of the income statement, this is basically your net sales. Uh, so this is your net sales minus then the cost of goods sold, 
the cost of goods sold being supported by the cost of goods sold calculation, reconciling the balance sheet account of beginning inventory and ending inventory. And that then gets you to the pit stop of gross profit. So gross profit is just another pit stop. You know, you can see we're going, it's always going down, going down to here. And then we'll put all of our other expenses basically into one category, other operating expenses to finally get to the bottom line net income. We've got a little bit more complication on all the other expenses because of things like the home office, for example, and stuff like that. But we'll talk about that later. So this is the cost of goods sold for this business that we figure that is figured on the on like the cost of goods sold second page calculation. So we had inventory at the beginning of the year 37845 and then plus purchases minus items withdrawn for personal use. So basically purchases net uh, 283, uh, 250 goods available for sale. The beginning inventory plus what we purchased is what was available, what we could have theoretically sold during the year, but we didn't sell 32,955 because it was still in ending inventory giving us cause to goods sold. Now, remember, I used to get confused in terms of why they force us to do this because you might say, hey, look, I have my books and they're done on a perpetual inventory system. You're making me do this calculation that's that's a periodic inventory system, and you're making it, me do it on a yearly basis. Why is that the case? Because on my books, I already have cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold is calculated. You can see it here. So your, your books that might come from like software like QuickBooks will already have typically this number calculated using whatever inventory tracking method you're using perpetual method first in first out at weighted average or whatever but and so this is a periodic system that you're going to need to possibly back into to some degree because the irs what they're really looking for in my opinion is the balance sheet account they're reconciling inventory so they want to give it they're trying to reconcile beginning and ending inventory to justify uh, that number and they don't have a balance sheet. So the cost of goods sold is is giving us that that reconciliation, which means we're basically recalculating whatever inventory method that we are using to calculate gross profit on a periodic method for a yearly basis, basically to reconcile the inventory. Okay, items to check. Consider the following items before figuring your gross profit, gross receipts. So at the end of each business day, make sure your record balance with your actual cash and credit receipts for the day. This is basically a bookkeeping type of thing. Question comes up from a taxpayer, tax preparer perspective. How much support do we want to be giving on the bookkeeping? And what kind of networks are we going to help to, for our clients for bookkeeping versus just data input? on the tax return side of things. You may find it helpful to use a cash register to keep track of receipts. You should also use a proper invoicing system and keep a separate bank account for your business. These are all best practices, many small businesses. It would be great if they had a separate bank account, It'd be great if they use the double entry accounting system, make sure that they verify all of their stuff. Sometimes they don't, sometimes they might be using one bank account and using a QuickBooks system possibly to separate separate out business income from personal and so on and so forth. So it gets messy in real life because a lot of small businesses in particular are not excellent bookkeepers and possibly don't have the funds to really, you know, hire professionals uh, so much or you have to convince them it's worthwhile in some cases, depending on the size of the business as to how professional they're going to be with their bookkeeping. So so that's one of the things that most likely if you're doing business tax preparation, that are questions that are commonly going to come up and struggles that you will be struggling with. Sales tax calculated. Check to make sure your records show the correct sales tax calculated. Uh, if you collect state and local sales tax imposed on you as the seller of goods or services from the buyer, you must include the amount collected in gross receipts. So if you are required to collect state and local taxes imposed by the buyer and uh, turn them over to state or local governments, you generally do not include these amounts in income. So sales tax is going to be a, another kind of complication remembering that for taxes, 
we have a federal income tax system to fund the federal government. And then on the state side of things, the state can tax however they want to, and they might use a sales tax type of system, which might change from locality, state and local to state and local. So how do you account for the sales tax then? Well, if when you're purchasing items, when you're purchasing say inventory and sales tax is charged, then typically you're gonna include the sales tax in the cost of the thing that you purchased as part of your inventory that will ultimately be expensed in the form of cost of goods sold. That's gonna be like just a cost to you to buy the, the inventory typically. When you're selling the inventory, then you're the one that has to charge the sales tax. So you sold it for $100. Let's say you have to charge another $15 for sales tax. You're going to collect $115. Well, the IRS is, you, there's two ways you can account for that. You can imagine, why don't I just include it in sales possibly at $115? And then I have an expense of sales tax expense which will be $15 resulting in net income of $100. One way that you can do it. That's not the way the IRS likes to see it though. They want it done this way. You sell it for $100. When you, when you sell it, you record sales of $100 and then you collected $115 and the added $15 is gonna be cash collected. The other side, instead of going to revenue, goes to sales tax payable, a liability account. And then when you pay it in the future, it's going to come out, you're going to decrease cash and not record sales tax expense, but rather reduce the liability account. Why does the IRS want to do it this way? Because in theory, the sales tax is on the purchaser, not on the business. The business is just being used as the tax collector. So, so obviously I say in theory, because when you look at the economics of it, obviously you're increasing your sales price due to the sales tax and that's going to have an impact on everything and so on but the idea is that it's on the it's on the consumer therefore it shouldn't be included in revenue even though the net income would be the same so what would happen revenue would be on the books for $100 instead of revenue being on the books for $115 minus the expense sales tax expense of 15 this becomes relevant as well because a lot of people will say hey look small businesses will ask you, I pay sales tax. I should have a sales tax expense on my income statement. That's a big expense. Uh, but if they didn't include the revenue on the income statement, then you're not going to have the sales tax on the income statement as an expense because it was recorded off the income statement, right? Both the revenue and the expense side should be going through like an accounts payable or a payable type of account. So, that's something that logistically you're going to have to set up from a bookkeeping standpoint and then try to make sure that you have it properly recorded on uh, the tax return. If you have something on your books called sales tax expense on the business books, that could be kind of a red flag because, again, that's not exactly how the IRS is typically expecting to see it. They're expecting to see both income and expense side off balance sheet usually. I'm sorry, off income statement you know, on the balance sheet. So one more quick read of this, just to get this idea in. If you collect state and local sales taxes imposed on you as the seller. So now, now the idea of the sales tax is, it, is that it is on you of goods or services from the buyer. You must include the amount uh, collected in gross receipts. However, if you are required to collect state and local taxes imposed on the buyer, so now you're collecting the taxes and you're basically just acting as the t tax collector. And then you have to turn them over to the state or local governments. Uh, you generally do not include these amounts in income. So again, you might ask in this situation, the second one, how would you account for it? If you're not including it in income, you would think I'd include it in income and then have an expense. But no, you would think in this case, then because it's on the buyer, you're going to include it in accounts payable accounts payable or sales tax payable going up and then sales tax payable going back uh, down. It's a general idea. Okay, so inventory at the beginning of the year. So compare uh, this figure with last year's ending inventory, the two amounts should usually be the same. So this is something that you wanna make sure to check on as a tax preparer because that's just doing kind of your due diligence. 
if your your beginning inventory doesn't tie out to what happened last year, you're likely going to have a problem because the IRS is going to come back and ask questions about it. So you want to make sure that you kind of do that due diligence double check so that uh, so that you get everything properly filled out so it doesn't stall up the return or anything. Purchases. If you take any inventory items for your personal use, use them yourself, provide them to your family, or give them to a personal gift or as a personal gift, be sure to remove them from the cost of goods sold. For details on how to adjust cost of goods sold, see merchandise withdrawn. So in other words, if you dip it into your own stash for basically personal use, we talked about that in the cost of goods sold calculation, you, you want to make sure that you're kind of recording it like as a draw basically rather than expensing it if you don't what you end up doing is over expensing which is basically what the iris is going to be skeptical of it would be like you're purchasing things out of your business account if you went to disneyland or something and wrote it off as a business expense because it came out of your business account you would be over expensing reducing the net income which would be bad for taxes. No, you have to record it off the income statement as a draw uh, instead. Even if you paid it directly to Disneyland or whatever, you, you record it as a decrease to cash going to the draws. Similar thing with the cost of goods sold. If you're buying the cost of goods sold and recording it as purchases and then using it you know, yourself, then you're basically expensing the, the cost of goods sold in a similar way. And you would think that if that happened, you'd have to record it kind of as draws. So inventory at end of year. Check to make sure your, your procedures for taking inventory are adequate. These procedures should ensure all uh, items have been included in inventory and proper pricing techniques have been used. So ending inventory then, we're probably, if you're using tax software or something, or if you're using accounting software, you will have that number. But if you're using a perpetual inventory system, you still want to check your ending inventory to make sure that you're recording it properly and do like a physical count at the end of the year. And if there's any spoilage or anything like that, you're properly accounting for the value of the inventory, which is again, more of a bookkeeping side of things. So use inventory forms and adding machine tapes as the only evidence for your inventory. Inventory forms are available at office supply stores. These forms have columns for recording the description, quantity, unit price, and value of each inventory item. So you would think, that, again, you could probably do this if you have accounting software, for example, so that you have the supporting calculation. What does the IRS have? They have the calculation of the cost of goods sold, tying out beginning and ending inventory. If they were to audit you, then they might have questions about that calculation and that ending inventory number, how you arrived at the ending inventory, you'd have to, you know, give, possibly give them evidence of that valuation. So each page uh, has space to record who made the physical count, who priced the item, who made the extensions, and who proofread the calculations. These forms will help you confirm that the total inventory is accurate. They will also provide you with a permanent record to support its validity. Testing gross profit accuracy. So if you are in a retail or wholesale business, you can check the accuracy of your gross profit figure. First, divide gross profit by the net receipts. The resulting percent uh, measures the average spread between the, the merchandise cost of goods sold and the selling price. So in other words, we're basically doing some statistical analysis here to, to see that the gross profit basically uh, makes sense, right? So if I, if I take my, my sales minus cost of goods sold gives me the gross profit, I can look at the gross profit percent taking gross profit divided by you know, my sales price, for example. Uh, next, compare this percent to your markup policy. In other words, if we sell units of inventory, if they're all the same kind of inventory, then our markup is gonna be uniform. So we should have so so there should be a uniform relationship, a uniform percentage relationship between our our gross profit. And this is a way that we can kind of double check our sales numbers. This becomes a lot more complex if we sell a whole wide range of inventory that has a, a whole lot a lot of different type of markup percentages. So how useful will this kind of calculation be? Depends on the industry that you're in, but 
this is the type of racial analysis that the government might do if they if they're questioning your tax return if they think that you have over calculated cost of goods sold they do this kind of calculation and they look at other businesses in your industry that have a, a much different uh, percentage you can see why that might be like a red flag for example is ratio analysis so little or no difference between these two percentages shows that your gross profit figure is accurate so a large difference between these percentages may show that you did not accurately figure sales purchases inventory or other items of cost so you should determine the reason for the difference so obviously this would be a normal practice if you have like a periodic inventory system that you're using you can do this type of analysis and say something happened here was there shrinkage did someone steal some of my inventory this is one way that you can do a, an internal or double check even though you don't have a perpetual inventory system but rather using a periodic inventory system so you have to depend on the physical count but you could still do this kind of double check to make sure that the gross profit seems reasonable example you operate a retail business on the average you mark up your merchandise so that you will realize a gross profit of uh 331 over three percent on its sales so the net uh receipts gross receipts minus returns and allowance uh showing on your income statement are 300,000. your cost of goods sold is 200,000. the result is a gross profit of 100,000, which is of course the sales 300,000 minus the 200,000 cost of goods sold to test the accuracy of your year's results you divide the gross profit 100,000 by the net receipts 300,000 resulting in the 331 over 0.03%. The Let me do that here with a calculator because that's uh, I think might, might have copied over funny. So the general idea here would be that we mark up the, the merchandise so that we get a gross profit of one over three or 33% if I move the decimal over two spaces. Now, if that's our standard process, then you would think that that if that's what we do on a sale by sale basis then you would think that the aggregate of all the sales would follow that that general policy as well therefore if i was to take the 100,000 my total uh my 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 total gross profit divided by the uh 300,000 then i'm going to get basically that same percent right and if I don't get that same percent, it might be because there were some other things involved, shrinkage, theft, or something like that, that happened. Uh, so it might not be exact. This is just going to be an estimate, but it can give you a general round figure, a general idea, which is useful in practice as well. Okay, so additions to gross profit. So if your business has income from a source other than its regular business operations, enter the income on line six of schedule C and add it to gross profit. The result is gross business income. So we might have other uh, income that we can include there. And that's going to give us our gross business, business income. Some examples include income from interest bearing checking account income from scrap sales, income from certain fuel tax credits and refunds and amounts recovered from bad debt that might go into that categorization.